Um, I don't know what just happened. We just lost everyone that was on there. Oh, Ash is back. Hi, Ash. Hi, Ash. I, I came in as a participant. Uh, my other link wouldn't let me in as a, I don't know. Anyway, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we all just got kicked out. Right. So uh -oh. I, wondered, I don't know how that happened. Did it say you had another meeting in, in at the same yes. time? Yes. Yeah. I and I left that meeting and then I came back in and just registered as a participant. So a lot, a lot of demand on Zoom. Uh-huh. Yes. Some yes, the there ones. is. <laughs> Good to meet you, Samir. Yeah. Nice to see you, Ash. Sure. See you as well. I think it's this end other meeting thing that is uh, messing us up for some reason. Like if uh, in my case, sometimes if I'm using the meeting ID that I get from uh, Zoom and, and I use it to schedule several meetings, it won't let me use the same ID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, What's well, just strange because this is Kate anyway. All right, well, welcome all the students who are joining us. We'll get started in a couple minutes. And we are already recording. So um, once we see the everything die down a little bit, we can get started. You want to put your slides back up again, Ash? Make, make sure that works. <laughs> um, I don't have you as a co-host, but I can make you a co-host if you need to. Perfect, looks good. Hi, Kate. All right, it looks like we have a few more people joining in. We'll give it just a minute. Okay, I think I can do a screenshot now, Ash, if you smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, three, two, one. Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> So, Nana, I'd say whenever you're ready, if you want to start into uh -huh. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone. Graduate Business Career Management is so happy you were able to join um, the team and myself to welcome Ash Sadiq. Did I pronounce that correctly? Mm -hmm. Ash Sadiq, perfect. Uh, Ash, I'm proud to say, is an SCU MBA alum from 2001. He's had a, a stellar and long career. He was started... Um, early on at Cisco, and he was there for nine years as a senior manager for content strategy. Um, he has an extensive background in executive coaching and leadership development, uh, helping high potential leaders um, succeed and be their best. And interestingly enough, he's also an author of a book uh, with, I think your co-author, is it Ruben, Miss Ruben? Uh, Leslie Rubin, yes. Leslie Rubin. I did not remember her first name, so I called her Ms. Rubin. Uh, author of a book uh, on Amazon titled Meaning, How Leaders Create Meaning and Clarity During Times of Crisis and Opportunity. So um, with, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Ash. And uh, have you, there, there's the book. Yes. So have you take it from here. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nina. So I'm very excited we have the Santa Clara community with us on the phone. And we want to make this very interactive. So definitely unmute yourself, ask questions. We want to make this, uh, you know, give and take throughout the, the session. 
And I think one of the key challenges I see, I see all of us struggle with is when people ask us the question, what is it that you do? And people go through it three minutes, five minutes, six minutes, and sometimes you listen to what's being said and you still don't know what they are saying. And that's really why uh, uh, working with the team here in Santa Clara University, we, we put this together. And before we get into the content, I want us to raise our hands and basically say, here is what's on my mind, Ash. I wish you could tell me how to do X, Y, and Z. So I would love for people who are uh, here with us today to unmute themselves and share um, what's, what's top of mind for them right now. Even if you want to jot it in the chat window, that's fine as well. Um, What's I'll the say, one thing you'd like to get? I'll say something. Uh, for me, I yeah. just would like to know how to, um, you know, make my hook more concise. Mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome. And I see someone writing, I need tips to improve my elevator pitch. Fantastic. Anyone I, else? Yeah, I want to learn how to start to define a personal brand. Very nice. Okay. We'll definitely talk about that. Let's see what else. Don't be shy. <laughs> kind of going along with that, like how to define what your, what is like how to find your personal brand or to find, you know, what your elevator pitch is going to be, like a first yeah. starting point, figuring it out. Awesome. One more? Okay, I will, I will go ahead. It looks like we're all here for the same reason. And we'll just jump right into the content. And usually when, when I talk with people and based again on my experience working, the main thing that I think is the most valuable is if we actually walk away from today's conversation, not necessarily with a skill set, but it's actually more of a shift mentally. It's a mental shift. And that's really what I'd love to happen. And I would love to hear from you after the session if you think that happened for you. So the three shifts that I would like to discuss with you, number one is how we actually view what we do. Do we view it as a gig? Do we view it as a job? Or do we view ourselves as what I call enterprise? And I'm going to explain what that is as we go into it. And then we get to the question is what do I do and how do, how do we define what it is that we do? And then we come back to now that we've defined what we do, how do we actually communicate that? How, what's our hook? How do we make it intriguing enough so that when we actually do say it, people pause and say, hmm, that's interesting. We actually have this need in our company or I know somebody who would be very, very good candidate for that conversation. And then we look at number four where, where, where we bring it all together and we think through a model that I would be sharing with you at the very end. So here's what the very first one talks about. When we look at what we do and we think about our careers, a lot of the time, just conventional thinking, we've all been, we've all been there. We basically think about what career do I want? What do I want to do? And we start thinking in terms of a job and we start thinking of working for somebody else, right? So the answer to all of this is that we don't want to think of anything that we do as a gig because now there are so many gigs on the web there are so many people who are doing code and code gigs and these are very short projects sometimes the price is fixed and you get on some of those uh, websites like upwork and other platforms where you're really pitching a tent and you're basically saying i can do graphic design for this much if you tell me exactly what you want i will do it for you and then sometimes we are pitching a job and we go and we apply for a job and then we go into these companies and we're thinking I am working now for ABC company and there is the company's culture and there's uh, the rules and regulations of that company, the job description, the, the team that I'm on. And a lot of the time you're again, looking at yourself as part of that machine. But the most interesting mindset that I want to share with you is this mindset of really looking at yourself as an enterprise, whether you're working for yourself or for somebody else, you're always working for you. 
And we're always working for you. It's very important for us to build that engine behind this whole idea of when you are working for yourself, you need to bring a brand to the table. I love the question about the personal brand. And the brand is going to actually come across when, when people are interacting with you and you walk away, they say, it was interesting having a conversation with this person because there was something about them, there was something about how they carried themselves, how they talked, how they articulated the message, how they explained what it is that they do that is different from other people. So we come to this concept that I ended up publishing in a book and it's the concept called own it, win it, crush it. And it's a success formula. And I think it really forms a mindset that I, to be honest with you, I picked it up at Deloitte and Touche when I worked as a management consultant. Um, I walked into this company after working for Schwab and the amazing difference between Schwab and Deloitte was between night and day. From a mindset perspective at Schwab, I had to get in there at seven o'clock, buttoned up. It's, it's a suit. You have to wear it every single day. You have to walk out the door at a certain time. It is a corporate mindset and it works really well for the shop organization. When you go into management consulting, something happens because they basically tell you, hey, you're going to go into Kaiser Permanente and you have to remember, you do not represent Kaiser, you represent Deloitte. And you need to carry that brand every step of the way. When you go into a meeting, if everybody in that meeting gets upset, you will be the one person in that meeting that doesn't. So you have to have a way of detaching yourself from everything around you and remember the brand that you represent. So if we cannot detach ourselves from the brand of the company that we work for, we will never know this whole idea of I will be in this meeting and whatever happens in this meeting, I have something to protect. And that something that I need to protect is the brand that I need to bring to the table. So the question is, how do you actually form this enterprise called you? And if you haven't read books by Tom Peters, he has a book that talks about this whole concept of how we can see ourselves as professional services organizations. In simple English, how can you see yourself as someone who's providing a consulting service? And if you are providing consulting services, like some of us are doing data analytics services, uh, graphic design, it could be uh, software programming, it could be marketing, could be any of the above. All of those are services. And you need to basically say, I am the CEO of this company and I run it a certain way. And in order for me to power up and do it so, so well, I need to have mastery of myself. I need to have mastery of what it is that I do. And that's the value creation that I do for my customers. And then I also need to make sure that I have a customer success function within my company. Because if you're that one person who's looking at themselves as a full-fledged business, that essentially means you're doing marketing, you're doing business development, you're doing operations, you're doing customer success, you're doing billing, you are following up on payments, you're doing the whole nine yards. And again, I really would love for you to adopt that mindset, even if you're working full-time for an organization where you don't even have to ask them for the money. They're gonna send you the check every two weeks. Never, ever, 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 ever get sucked into the tunnel of thinking that you're now part of this machine. Because if you're part of this machine and somebody says something and you get twisted out of order and then you start behaving as a result of what was said, you lost it. You lost this whole idea of the fact that you are running your own show. Whether you're working for them full time, on a contract basis, you're, or you're only in there for a few hours. So this concept of you being an enterprise is such an amazing concept because it will give you that power every single day to be powerful in every conversation because you're not like a bird in the wind. You're not going to be basically be shaken up and down. I remember a conversation with someone that used to work with me at Cisco and she basically said her boss said something and she went home, sat on the couch and just started crying because of what her client said. So if we look at them as clients, then it also frees us up from the attachment we give people around us. We need to separate it out, look at the feedback as this is actually feedback on my service. And also, by the way, remember, if she's your client, you can fire your client. And that's one thing we don't even realize that sometimes, and yes, some of us say, you know what, I don't like this job, I'm going to quit. 
And that's when you're basically saying, I am actually going to walk away from this client. And it's very important to remember that you have that. So now we come to the own it, win it, crush it as a success blueprint, because we need this to go into when we talk about our hook. We need to be, to be people who have a responsible mindset, which means if everybody else is having a victim mindset and they are blaming COVID-19 and they're blaming this and blaming that, you will be that one person who runs his or her own, her own company. And you basically say every day, if it's to be, it's up to me. If somebody's going to reach out to this customer, I'm going to be the one who picks up the phone. If somebody needs to reach out to this customer, I'm going to be the person that writes that email and on and on and on and on. Because if you give in to the fact that you're waiting for your boss or you're waiting for your colleague, again, this came from Deloitte. We always were told if it's to be, it's up to you. You're going to, ha you're going to have to take action. Don't say I'm waiting for the client and I'm just going to sit and wait for the email to show up. I won't wait. I will call them up. I will text them. I will email them. I will make it happen, right? Because I am essentially adopting that. If it's going to happen, it's because I did something. An abundance mindset basically says there is business, there is money every day of the year. Again, <laughs> COVID-19 or otherwise, just look at how much money Amazon is making, Walmart is making, Costco is making. So many of them are making a ton of money. FedEx is making, the US Postal Service is making. Thank goodness, right? All of this is happening despite everything, right? So an abundance mindset will always say there are always jobs no matter what the circumstances are. And a consultative mindset essentially means you're always focused on finding the solution. So then we come back to how are we gonna win? And we're gonna win by having a brand standard and everything I'm actually saying comes down to you really sort of elevating your standards and your experience and what you can offer by doing the best you can. You went to Santa Clara, you got an amazing degree. Now the question is, how do I actually monetize, monetize it? And I monetize it by making sure that I'm going to bring the best level of service and the, le the best level of skill to the table. And when people interact with me, again, they're gonna say, you know what, that was different. Somehow they sent the message, they followed up, they did a great job, they made sure I got what I wanted. It's the experience that you create is essentially the composite behind value creation. And then lastly, like any business you run, if you do it so well, if you do number one and number two so well, what starts to happen is people call you back. If you're working for company A and you leave them for two years, you get a phone call and say, hey, what are you doing? We got something here that we think would be, you'd be amazing for. So this whole idea of creating the conditions for these phone calls to come happens when you do such an amazing job for some company and your colleagues and everybody around you sees the kind of quality you bring to the table, that's when we start getting these phone calls and we get jobs without applying for jobs. Applying for jobs is for those who think conventionally. In order for us to create a different dynamic, we have to think in an unconventional way and thinking in an unconventional way will happen when we apply some of the ideas we'll see coming up as well. So this whole idea of repeat business, new business, whether again, you're, you're doing it yourself or working for somebody else, it's going to happen when we do such an amazing job with whatever it is that we are being asked to do. So before I get into the next part, does anybody have any questions on what we just said? Un unmute yourself and, and talk, don't worry about it. Default. Resonating, not resonating. Uh, yeah. None and impact. Hi, I'm actually interested in the book you talked about. It was for Todd Peters. You said. Uh, for Todd you... Peters. I, I think it's called the uh, Enterprise 50. I'll make sure I get the right title and send that over to you. But of course, Tom Peters used to be yeah, management no, consulting no. and the whole book is about this whole idea of just run it like you own it, whether you're working That's for them question. or just working for yourself. You're always working for yourself, right? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments? Um, okay. All right, so we'll jump into uh, another mindset, which is if we go back to the title slide, what I do, what's my target customer and what's my hero? And the word hero here means if you work in um, customer journey consulting, they use the word hero to describe 
the kind of customer they want to serve and how they want to make that customer a hero in their own world. So that's really what I mean by the word hero. Um, and what we're really trying to do here is we need to start thinking not about jobs necessarily. We actually want to start thinking about what the market is looking for. It's really a market focused view on how we can approach what it is that we do. So we end up basically then having to think about um, if we have a particular service, let's say we're, we, we're doing data science or we're doing marketing, we have to start looking for companies and businesses and market segments where we believe we have an opportunity to help that target customer or that target company uh, or that target business owner in an exponential way. How can we actually go to them and pitch something that basically says, if you do work with us, it's going to be an amazing experience for you because we're, we are just going to do such an amazing job for you. So we start getting clear on that target hero and their aspirations. And that again is going to change how we approach the job market, how we approach interviews. Uh, it's a whole different story because we're really coming at it almost like, again, like we are a business and we are providing services and that's going to just change how we look at the opportunity and how we actually pitch ourselves. So in order for us to think about what it is that we do, I developed something called the tension index. And actually that was driven by experience uh, consulting with Cisco with their innovation teams, where if we are providing graphic design, if we are providing data science, if providing accounting, finance, you, you name it, what it is, whatever it is that we are providing. Usually there is one part of the company that, that that need might exist. And that's what we essentially call, there is some tension in some part of the company. And that tension means there is a business need in that particular part of the company. Usually that business need actually replicates itself in so many different parts of the company, typically across a number of topics. And as you actually find how big that issue is, for them, if it actually exists in more than one department, if it exists across several departments, as much as you actually uncover how big the problem is, that's what you're really uncovering the, the amount of tension that exists in the company. And the tension here is between where things are at today and where they need them to be. And that's really where, as much as you can uncover that information, again, people in consulting will realize this is essentially the, the inf information they need to come up with a proposal and also to come up with evaluation for if they were to solve the problem, how much money would that mean for that business? Because you do not want to give them a proposal based on the number of hours that you put into it. It would actually be more on the, on the value that you bring to the table. And that's really where the tension index is important. You might actually find a lot of information about a target company that you're trying to approach by finding out what issues, what problems exist in the organization, and then run a multiplied effect in your head because if it exists in one place, and if the company has 70,000 employees and 1,500 locations, you can only imagine how big that problem is. So now, We've shifted as Santa Clara graduates or students the conversation from a tiny need to a more strategic need. And yes, not all needs are going to be strategic, but at the very least, you've shifted the conversation. And that's what we do with the tension index. And now once we actually find all of that, then it actually gets excited, exciting because now, depending on what it is that you do, you can actually start linking between that tension and what it is that you actually bring to the table. And that's why we use a new model called the TIE model. And the TIE model stands for tension, inspiration, and excitement. Because you immediately will start getting excited because you can see that there is something that you can bring to the table that's going to make a difference in this company. So you have to go through the stages of amplifying the tension, getting excited about envisioning and imagining what the solution could be and then you get excited so that when you go into the interview you are already fired up because you can clearly see that you can bring something to the table and then of course yes how are we going to articulate our differentiation in that conversation and that's i know is something that's on our mind so this whole idea of of energy and excitement is something that's very very critical as we get into the 
the hook component, right? And of course, the purpose of any pitch, whether we're pitching a startup company or we're pitching you as a professional, after we send in the resume and the cover letter, or even if I speak to somebody, my role here is not to send as much information as I want or as I can. It's actually really more about putting something in front of them that's going to create enough intrigue and enough excitement for them to say, hey, would love to have a conversation. And that's very important. I know sometimes we're trying to send a three page resume, a very long cover letter. I would say to you, try to find a way to create intrigue. And it could actually be by you not sending a resume, by you, by you not sending a cover letter, but rather maybe sending a, a brief video where you basically say, I read this, I saw this, I think there's an opportunity here. I'd love to have a conversation. And you basically beg to differ. You don't send nothing other than that video. Um, or, you know, find somebody that can actually help you make an introduction. So one of the key underlying ideas I'm trying to share with you is do something different than what everybody else does. So now, just take a minute and think about, depending on what my specialty is, my work experience has been, then you need to start thinking, hmm, I wonder who my target customer is. Is that a particular industry? Is that a particular type of company? What are the particular type of issues that they should be having? And then also from a tension index standpoint, how big is that problem? Is it just tiny one in one department where they're not gonna care that much about it? Or is it endemic across the business? Are they budgeting money for it? Are they investing money in it? Because we know in any company that are functions within the company where uh, they may not necessarily be interested in spending any more money into it. Sometimes actually they cut off whole divisions. So it really requires some strategic thinking by looking at the market, scanning the industry that you wanna focus on and ask yourself, I have to get strategic here. I need to find an opportunity a particular pain point that they have that is big enough or you know hairy enough and difficult enough that when I go talk to them about the kind of work I did in Santa Clara and the type of labs I worked on and some of the exercises we, we, we dealt with and the data sets and, and the kind of algorithms we came up with how all of those are going to help this organization so with that in mind I'm actually going to give you an opportunity later on to raise your hand if you want to and actually articulate your pitch if you'd like to do some practice and get some feedback. So just bear that in mind. So now we start thinking about how are, how are we going to actually articulate our elevator pitch. In the back of your mind, you just want to keep in mind those four buckets. I need to create some kind of a context similar to what we were doing with the um, uh, tension index and what we were doing with the time model. We were really trying to find a specific situation, a specific problem, and we also want to amplify the problem. We need to really make sure it's very painful because if it's not painful, we're not going to be there for a long time. We're not going to be helping them in a way that creates a lot of value. Remember that middle box was about value creation. So you want to get yourself associated with something that's actually meaningful in terms of the value it's going to create and the impact it's going to have for the company. And I know that's not easy, but I'm basically trying to say, just be greedy, go after the big fish. And then start thinking about the part of the solution that you bring to the table and also step back and think about what other pieces of that solution does this company need? And can you actually be someone that can actually help them bring the pieces of the puzzle together? Companies need people like that. And that's another important point. They no longer need point solutions. They no longer just need the data scientist or the analyst or the accountant. They need someone who is resourceful. Like I remember at Cisco, there were 50,000 employees, now 70,000, 80,000. And a lot of the time, most of us make the mistake of looking at the team that they are a part of and they just look around and they see five, seven people and they can be there for five years, 10 years, 20 years. And you know what? They only talk to those five, 10 people. But the company has 70,000. And most of these companies have a directory that's more beautiful and more powerful than LinkedIn. Here's why it's more powerful. They all work for the same company. So when you knock on the doors of any one of those ladies and guys and say, I am working on X, I'm stuck, I need some help. Do you mind if we schedule 30 minutes? 
So that whole company with the 70,000, or sometimes if you go work for IBM and you're dealing with more than 300,000, that's how big that city is. And I would love for you to start thinking of yourself as someone who connects the dots. Because if you just see yourself as somebody that does one thing, you're just going to be like thousands and thousands and thousands of other people. And you do not want to think that way. So when you think about the solution, please get out of the box that sits around you and break that box and just see the whole world as your opportunity of bringing these solutions to the table. And then the very last thing, of course, the outcome that they are looking for, you will be part of creating that outcome, but you also realize that there are pieces of that outcome that again, your resourcefulness may help bring, bring to the table. So now, how do we structure that conversation for the elevator pitch? Now that we've looked at the tension index, we looked at the time model, we looked at that backstory of situation, problem, solution, and outcome, now we start looking at the two sides of the bridge. We have what they want and we have what we could do. And we need to build the bridge. We need to connect the dots. We need to do some mapping. And this can happen on a whiteboard where you basically write a list of what they're looking for and a list of what you could bring to the table. And then also you remember on that list is your whole idea of resourcefulness, what you can actually do for uh, the organization by bringing other people to, uh, to the table. I'm just gonna take a quick look here at the chat that might have come in, okay? So how do we investigate or drill down on those pain points? Uh, identify the value that you would bring. Usually that's, and thank you very much, uh, Kim. So I think the question here is, how do we, hey, Ash, I mean, how do we find all that stuff out? Lots and lots of information, of course, exists on the web, on Google. If you do some searching, the company uh, 10K report, you can go to the investor relations uh, webpage, listen to some of their uh, 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 market calls, uncover nuggets and nuggets of information. And then you can also reach out to people that know somebody in this company on LinkedIn and say, hey, I'd love to talk to someone. I can see a couple of data points. I would love just to learn some more because I'd like to present myself for an opportunity, but I want to be as, I want to be as knowledgeable as I can. Of course, if we are on the outside, there is such a, there is a limit to how much we can find because we're really trying to approach that castle by talking to some of the people that live there or people who know uh, the people that live there, right? Look, talking to the neighbors as best as, best as best we can. But if you're working on the inside, you have an opportunity to actually uncover a lot more value creation by scheduling these conversations because you work for ABC company and you can, can have these conversations. So as much as you can do, you can leverage a lot of those external resources. Some of them, you can actually pay money and get more detailed information on what technology this company is using, um, you know, what issues they're having. If you look at some analyst reports, they'll talk to you about the fact that they're having supply chain issue, or they just don't know what to do with the data they have. They are just basically being drowned uh, underneath all this data and they can be making money out of it and they're not doing enough of a job doing so, okay? So now we come to the next step here and we need to remember Maya Angelou and Maya Angelou basically said, people will always forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And this shows up because in one of my career stints, I was actually a recruiter. And sometimes you call somebody on the phone, there's just no energy on the other side. There's no energy. And that in my mind is step one. And what we're going to do here is now that we've developed that tension index understanding, the excitement of the solution that we're gonna be coming up with, now you know that the very fundamental and important piece that you need to get across, especially in, in an environment now where there are 50 million Americans that are out of jobs, it's going to be what's gonna differentiate you out of the masses. And I think energy is the biggest differentiator because if you hire someone that's got the energy, that's got the passion, even if what they're working on is going to change, you know, if you just give it to that person, just the sheer force of their energy is going to create energy in the room that they walk in, right? So that's really important. That's really why uh, it's very critical for us. So that's now we get to this amazing concept of looking at ourselves as people who own enterprises 
and we are running them and we are the CEOs of those companies and we're not necessarily just the chief executive officer, but we're also the chief excitement officer. And that essentially means now that we put on our eyes on what the target customer is, we try to find an opportunity where there's a big need, there's a big, huge tension issue in the company between what needs to be and what is. And now we could visualize what that solution looks like. We've also thought resourcefully of other people that we can bring to the table. Now we cannot wait to see the achievement and the accomplishment of that vision that we have. And again, bring this to reality. If at the very least I'm talking to someone about a job opportunity and I just come across as having a little bit more energy, a little bit more understanding of the company, a little bit un more understanding of what the need is, I am good. I am a whole lot better than a lot of other people. And I think it comes back down to this issue. Uh, we've all been in the, work, in, the, in the job market sometimes and we're applying here and there. And I, I realize that it's always gonna come back to quality over quantity. You know, and I know it's sometimes it's very hard and you're trying your best to get an opportunity. But as much as you can get very tar uh, targeted on who you are reaching out to and just exert a bit more effort to arm yourself up with more information so that you get some level of excitement of pursuing an opportunity at a particular company. I think that in of itself could actually create the differentiation that will get you in the door versus somebody else. So I, I realize, I mean, again, some of that you may be, you may be thinking it's ivory tower, but I'd love you to really look at it from that perspective. So now how do we actually then do an elevator pitch that has embedded in it the hook so that when people hear it, they say, you know what, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. I'd love to speak with you some more. So even though in the background we have the situation, the problem, the solution, and the outcome, now we actually try to use the magic of a story to say all of that. And we have to do it in a way that immediately from the very first second we start talking, the person listening to us forgets about their phone and just focuses with you on what you are telling them. And that's why we start with, do you know how? because this one is the phrase we use to get them to see the situation that they might be in. And I start with it and I basically say, do you know how some companies struggle because they have so much data, they have so many different systems, they just don't know how to integrate those systems. They don't know how to make use of this data to help make them better decisions. And then I start to go on this road with them, this imaginary journey where they will be able to actually see this new world where the solution already happens. So I basically start saying to that person, imagine what it would look like when you have a solution that brings all this data together. And it, doesn't not, it does not only do that, it actually connects the dots between the different data points in a way that helps you make decisions. Wouldn't that be amazing? And then you come with the kicker, you basically say, this is exactly what I do. Because I'm a data scientist, I jump in onto teams that do exactly that kind of work. And you know what's really amazing? When we end up creating that kind of vision and make that solution happen for, our, for, for companies that I work for or customers that I serve, it's just a beautiful thing to see. But you know what? There is a reason behind all this. And that's the piece about what I believe. So here you can attach why do you actually care about all that as a career? There has to be something bigger than creating that software or helping them connect the dots for the decisions. Because maybe if this company is working in healthcare and based on what you do for them, they're going to be able to create much better pharmaceutical products much, much sooner. In my mind, I would actually start caring so much about people who are in hospitals and they're, waking for, uh, they're waiting for such an amazing product. And instead of that product taking 10 years, maybe by virtue of what you do for that company, that product takes less time. It could literally save lives. So what's happening here is we're really trying to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing, there is a much bigger story behind it only if we exert the effort. And that's why step number four is very critical. 
but what we believe, what drives us, why are we interested in this job? Why are we interested in that line of business? Because at some level, you need to look at it as a cause, as a movement, as you are righting the, law, the wrong. If there's somebody in the hospital and they are dying because there's no vaccine yet for COVID-19, I mean, that makes you angry. And we can basically say, yeah, but Ash, this thing just showed up a few months ago. Fine, but we're all waiting for that to happen, right? So we have this sense of urgency. We need to see it happen because we see people dying. If COVID-19 did not exist, issues still exist. So many of them, cancer, homelessness, you name it. And that's why I'd love for you to find an opportunity where you can actually make a link between what it is that you studied or your career experience, bridge the gap between those if you need to, and then look for a customer segment out there, a market, a company, a, a social need sometimes, because we definitely are not just talking for, talking about for profit, we're also talking about nonprofit, because at the end of the day, it all touches everybody. And that's really where we now, I wanna show you how we take all of this and start to build the language for this elevator pitch and make sure that within that elevator pitch, we provide that hook, right? So as you're delivering this message, when you look at that third row, this is really where you might say something that says, when I look at companies that do this, when I look at companies that help other companies build data science models, I see them going about it the wrong way. The way we go about it is, we really try to understand what really is going to drive value for you. And we don't do anything and we don't leave you until we make sure that you are able to achieve that value. So the piece about the hook is about you saying, I beg to differ. Because this is what's going to make sure that that person walks away and they're going to remember something. Because at some point in the conversation you said, but you know what? When I look at everybody else doing this, this is what they seem to be doing. And we actually beg to differ. We actually do this in a way that creates a whole lot more value. I'd love to tell you more about how we do this. And then you layer in the belief system that you have, then all of a sudden, again, you're somebody that's, that's again, not just looking for an opportunity to make some money. You're also look, you're looking for something much, much bigger. You're looking to make sense and purpose and meaning of what it is that you do, regardless of what industry it is. Whatever we're talking about here applies across the industries and applies across sectors. So now we want to see a complete example. And I want to see how we're doing on time. So this is a complete example about somebody who works in communications. They, they help companies, you know, come up with messages, communicate with the company, uh, people inside the company and people outside the company. Um, and as you can see here, if you look at the right hand side, you'll see that I've taken those phrases and I applied them in a way that helps you see what it is that the person who's saying these words does for a living, right? Do you know how leaders and companies struggle with how to get the word out to their employees, how to connect with them during challenging times, and how to inspire them during the good times to achieve even more? That's where I step in, and I help leaders craft compelling talks and messages that connect and inspire their audiences. The reason why I am passionate about this kind of work is that when employees are clear on what's expected of them and what they are up against, they are much more prepared to take action and create success for themselves and others and the organizations that they work for. I wonder if there are other leaders or companies who could use this kind of help that you'd be willing to make an introduction for me. The very last one here is one ad where you can include this ask at the end. But you only deserve the right to actually include the ask if you do such a great job on the front end of really clarifying what it is that you do and for whom and why. So this is just a way for me to say, this is what it looks like when you finally get it written down. Written down. So I know it's going to take you time to sit down, maybe have version one, version two, version three, and then seek opportunities where you are doing this pitch with other people. Maybe there are a few friends that you can practice saying it to them so that at the very end of that conversation, you pause and you ask them. 
did I make myself clear? Do you understand the situation where I am brought in? And you also, do you also understand what I actually end up doing? And if the answers to those questions are a yes, you will actually have accomplished something that a lot of people have a very hard time doing. I mean, I'm always amazed. And sometimes I make the mistake myself. Um, I start answering the question, but I don't give, give people the context. And I have to remind myself, I need to start with, do you know how? And I need to also use that word imagine as many times as I can, because it helps people visualize what the solution looks like. And then I immediately put my solution and map it to that uh, vision of the solution existing and live and kicking in front of them. So I'm going to give you now an opportunity to think about maybe perhaps raising your hand and just practicing here today. Um, and um, as you think about and prepare, I am going to share a couple more ideas and then we'll pause and see if anybody wants to uh, practice or get some input on their pitch. So given the fact that we spoke about so many things, if you were to remember one thing from this whole conversation, I want love for you to remember this whole thing about energy. And I know you've been there, you've talked to people and when you were talking to them, they were excited and they had a lot of energy and you walked away remembering. You may not even remember what they said, but you remember something that they were, thank goodness, they were amazing people, full of energy. And you can tell that these people, whatever it is that you were to give them, they will get it done for you, right? Because they just have that sheer force of character and you can tell they're all about getting things done. They have the energy, they bring it to the table and they don't mind showing it as well because you may be energized and energetic, but if you're not showing it, I have no idea it exists, right? Um, and then if I just share one more thing and that, that one more thing is always remember you're always on candid camera all the time. And here's what I mean by this. If we are contacting somebody on LinkedIn, if we're sending somebody an email, if we're texting somebody, if we're leaving somebody a voicemail, uh, if we're talking with somebody on the phone, the other person on the other side is actually looking at you and listening to you and reading your messages as if you are in a display box. In their mind, they're basically saying, you know what, if I have a job, I will give it to this person. Because as I interact with them, they are very proactive, they take action, they're willing to get things done, they speak clearly, when they send a message, they don't blame anybody, they take responsibility, they see abundance, they're very consultative, they own it, they are bringing expertise to the table. If they don't have expertise, they are also open to saying, I know who to bring to the table. So that's why we're basically saying you are on candid camera all the time. And I know this is hard and I know it's hard for you and for me. Sometimes we're just tired. We just wanna shut everything off. And I want you to say to yourself, it's okay that that's the case. I really would love for you to remember these words, the words, it's okay. Just say today, I am just gonna shut it all off. I'm tired, I cannot do it. Because once you say, I'm going to get on the stage, get in front of that camera, pick up the phone or send an email or do whatever, you're on candid camera. And a lot of the people you're interacting with, they could refer you for a job, they could interview for a job, they can give you a job, they can talk to somebody else about you. So this whole idea of creating referenceability is happening 24-7. Write that word down, referenceability. And in that model that we use in the very beginning, the own it, win it, crush it, crushing it happens because you have now built into the system this whole idea of referenceability. You did such a great job on the, on the own it side, on the win it side, that the crushing side becomes an autopilot uh, phenomena in your life because now the work that you've done ends up bringing more customers, ends, ends up having people refer other people to you. And if you can get word of mouth and referrals to kick in for you, even as a professional who's looking for a job, can you imagine if a friend of yours talks to a friend of his or hers and all of a sudden you're getting a phone call? 
That basically means you do not need to turn the LinkedIn jobs alerts on. You do not need to go to glass, uh, glassdoor.com. You do not need to go to career builder. You do not need to go to this side and that side and that side. Can you just imagine creating some of those dynamics to work for you? And before I jump into that very last piece, I want to see if anybody would like to, um, you know, jump in and practice um, and would be happy to do that. So if, if you want to let me know, because I think I have one more slide to share before we open it for any practice opportunities. Does anybody want to do a pitch using the script that I showed you? You know, do you know how imagine that's where I come in and that's, and then what I believe in. So, Hi, my, yeah, my, my name is Dipali. I'd like to give it a shot. Oh, fantastic, Dipali. So I will finish one more slide and then I'm going to give you the floor. Okay. And definitely other people, if you want to, uh, just like Dipali did, uh, jump in. So the very last um, point I want to share with you is, um, Another framework that I think it's very important for you to reflect on as well. Um, and I'm going to read what I wrote on this slide. This is remember the purpose of your pitch. Again, that's the resume, the cover letter, the spoken word. Again, it's not the quantity of the information. It's only to intrigue them enough to be invited for an interview. Remember that, right? So now we come to this uh, model and I call it the 3A model because it helps you Take everything that we talked about and just bring it down to what do I do? So the very first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure we have the right mindset. And that's why we talked about the own it when it crush it as a fundamental component of building up this, you know what? I own this thing. It's mine. I don't work for nobody. Even if they send me a check every two weeks because they happen to think I'm working for them full time, that's fine and dandy, but you know what? At the end of the day, I run this, I run this ship, right? So that mindset re really gets you to really treat this company so well and treat everybody around you so well and protect your brand because now that mindset is all about the fact that you've decided to have a brand and that brand is not in the wind for anybody to affect it. You are the only one that protect, protects it. So this first piece is making sure that you're constantly thinking about how, did, how you are positioning yourself and how you actually view yourself. The second one is, is the messaging that you're doing. Every time you're writing an email, texting, phone calling, whatever it might be, you're actually very conscious of the language you're using. You're, you're trying to be very clear and on, on point and creating intrigue and being memorable by doing something again that's different than what everybody else does. Right. And we talked and shared examples on that. Then the last thing that a lot of us forget. And when I was talking about the 70,000 employees and the 300,000 employees is the fact that you need to be thinking about not just looking at yourself as the only resource you have. You want to look at the networks you have, the Santa Clara team here and, and the organization behind them and the alumni network and the company you worked for and thousands of people who work there, LinkedIn and all these other tools that create such a multiplied effect for you, right? All these network effects we talk about in the Silicon Valley. So don't go it alone, start by giving, look for opportunities where you can contribute somehow. Uh, look for referrals, look for people that can actually refer you to other people, partner up with them, get creative, right? Uh, tap networks that already exist. Look for an association in that target market that you're trying to uh, penetrate and then reach out to that association and say, Hey, I just want to give, I want to volunteer. I want to work with you. I just want, I love this space and I want to work with you. And of course, on the back end of it is you're thinking strategically, I'm going to get to know the board. I'm going to get to know the people that work with the board. I'm also going to get to know the people that know them. Oh my God, look at the board. There are 10 people multiply that by another 10. That's like a hundred each. Right. But you have to, you have to, you have to put in uh, and give first, right? Um, so let's now uh, pause, uh, give uh, Depali a uh, an opportunity, and then if other people want to pitch in, as soon as she's done, we can we can also uh, give you an opportunity as well. And again, ask questions. Um, so, Depali, um, let's go for it. All right. Hi everyone. 
Uh, my name is Bali. Um, have you, um, do you know uh, what um, a senior level executive in a company or a new hire or a child of domestic abuse in a foster home or a 13 year old girl who is a victim of sex trafficking, um, your aunt in senior living, uh, do you know uh, what all of these people might have in common? So imagine uh, yourself flying in an airplane and the, the flight attendant is um, conducting their instructions. The first thing they say is, in case of an emergency, um, the oxygen mask is going to fall. And if you're traveling with a child, use oxygen mask on yourself first before you try to save the child. This is exactly what I do. I am the founder and CEO of uh, a nonprofit company and uh, I provide health and wellness, uplifting solutions, tools, and techniques to this entire population. Uh, my company is called Bispo Yoga and Wellness, and I work uh, primarily with the underserved, the vulnerable communities uh, to provide classes, workshops, um, conducting yoga and meditation. And uh, at the end of each session, I have seen positive impact on each one of my clients and, and you've seen the whole range of um, who they are. So this is what I do. Thank awesome, you. Awesome, Dupali. I love it. I love it. And we'll only get even better over time. So. Thank you. You're a great teacher. Thank you. And we'd love feedback from people. I mean, if people want to give feedback or if other people want to practice here, we'd love to hear them. Uh, so again, just speak up if you'd like to do so. Yeah, great job. I, I love your message. Um, I didn't hear an ask. Is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, who, was, uh, who was speaking? It's me, Kim. Um, no, I think it's mostly if somebody, if, you, if you'd like to practice, just like what Dipali did, we, can, we definitely have time to do so. Oh, I see. So just... Uh, listening to hers and trying to follow the steps and she got all the nails done hammer awesome. fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. anybody else any questions in general about everything we covered or something else ash i actually have a question sure um, do we need to change our elevator pitch based on the audience we're speaking to? Um, and again, I'll use my reference because in my audience, I am talking to youth and then I'm talking to uh, you know, potential um, funders. So it's the whole range. Um, you know, I'm not always going to be able to connect. Oh, this is the pitch I use for someone who's going to fund my, you know, invest in my company and this is youth I work for. So okay, do I change my elevator pitch? I think that's a good point, depending on, depending on potentially what that person you're talking to could possibly do. Let's say if they, are, if they can refer you to someone. So they ask at the end, like we did with the example, uh, depending on who that person is, that last sentence may differ, right? So if, if I know they know some VCs, I might say, I am in the market, I'm doing a fundraise. Do you happen to know anybody in that space? I'd love an introduction, right? So, so I might just shift the ask a bit more uh, and I may, uh, so I think the, the, do you know how imagine those two pieces and where I come in are actually consistent because you're trying to make sure they walk away knowing exactly what kind of space you are in and what you do and how you do it differently than other people. And also, why do you care about it? Why, why are you so passionate about that space? And then the ask me then differ based on who that person is. I, I think so. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Hey, Ash, this is Jessica. Do you still have uh, time for one more elevator pitch? Oh, yes, please. Okay, I want to take a try. Sure. Um, do you know how the successful job seekers get through difficulties and turn adversity into opportunity? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, that's where I step in. And then while well, we have a fantastic panel discussion scheduled on August the 5th, 
at 4.30. And we welcome our Santa Clara alumni and the students to join because I think um, every, no one ever got anything extraordinary done without initiating or accepting a challenge. So welcome. Um, we hopefully you can share this um, with your classmates and um, your friends. So join us. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, be before I give feedback, anybody wants to um, to give feedback? So my only recommendation uh, would be to uh, just I think the the only piece that we know, know. about uh, the piece about imagining. So I would say imagine imagine having panelists that would be speaking on X, Y, and Z, and you also get a chance to speak with them and things like that. So this may just help me get me more excited about being in the uh, at the event. Thank you. That's sure. a very great suggestion. So you can be more like engaging if you get a chance to talk to them, right? Yeah, exactly. So remember, the, 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 there is so much magic around the word imagine. Because awesome. it, it's almost sharing. like it brings people to walk with you in this uh, imaginary place. Right? Uh, it's like you're walking with them in the gallery and you're pointing things to them and you're able to see them. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so you're much. You're most Ashley. welcome. You're most welcome. Nice so I will Jessica. stop the screen share and um, help our hosts uh, uh, wrap us up. Well, before we do, can I add one tiny question? Um, sure. Ash, um, assuming that you are leading a big project and you would like to pitch your proposals to get funding, would you suggest we use the same methodologies and a pathway that you set out? to convince or get buy-in from our boards or our executives um, in yeah. order to, to win the project? Mm -hmm. I, I would say, I would say so because, because the pitch that we're talking about is going to get them to say, come in the room and tell us more about it because executives in the company are probably going to look for a presentation with a lot of data and so on. But first we need to hook them up with the, do you know how the company is struggling with A, B, C, and D? Imagine da 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 da, and then that's where this initiative is going to be focused on solving A, B, C, and D. And the reason why we care about it is because we see the money and we see how much revenue we're losing, and we believe that these customers are waiting for us to get this done for them. Uh, and now let us show you the data, right? But in the beginning, at least, I use the pitch structure and the script to energize me first so that I can energize them, right? It's going to rub off. And maybe also what, we, what you could do is you can uh, do some lobbying in the beginning, go to them individually with that passion and excitement and get them to imagine with you. And then you bring them together in one room. You already fired them up before. Now you add to that energy level and then back it up with all the details. And of course, talk about the risk management, risk mitigation. So when you hear me talking about chief excitement officer, it doesn't mean we are forgetting the downside, right? It doesn't mean that. It means that we're elevating the issue and we're also going to be looking at all facets of the issue. Terrific, terrific. Thank you so much. Great, Ash, thanks so much. Um, Kate Moody from Graduate Business Career Management. I just wanted, for the students who are on the line, just wanted to give a little bit of a plug for an event we're having next Tuesday, which is a virtual interviewing tips workshop. And what really made me think of it was Ash's idea about energy and enthusiasm and coming across that way. And uh, there's, a, there's some slides that we're gonna go through and some ideas about how you show up in a virtual engagement like this and carry that energy and enthusiasm forward with you. So I think it's a good kind of maybe segue into some of the things we learned today. So Tuesday at 4.30, I'm trying to think if it's at 4.30, yeah. is that noon? Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you, good noon. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday at noon, and um, you can register on Handshake or um, contact us at gvpcareers at scu.edu. All right, Sunana, off to you. <laughs> okay, well, I just wanted to say thank you. It was a, it was a great, great webinar. I know the students got a lot out of it. I, I'm really impressed with your technique uh, and approach, and just thank you from all of us in career management. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yep. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.